Uh, so my name is Elena Balko and I'm a historian at uh, Birkbeck College, the University of London. And uh, I'm here to talk about my book, um, Making Ukraine Soviet, uh, that is uh, recently published by Bloomsbury Academic. So the book is uh, mainly about the uh, cultural history of interwar Ukraine. And I'm looking at uh, culture and uh, literary politics uh, of the Communist Party during the 1920s mainly. And um, I decided to look at uh, two prominent writers, Ukrainian writers, the poet Paolo Tichila and prose uh, author uh, Mykola Khvilovy. And um, I've decided to write this book um, mainly uh, because I, I have always been interested in this period. Uh, for me, the 1920s, early 1930s is perhaps the most fascinating period in Ukrainian history, when a lot seemed to be possible, and there were a lot of people trying to do different things uh, or achieve different things. And um, I'm also particularly interested in literature and culture. And then I've decided to kind of combine these two my interests and try to look at cultural uh, politics, but at the same time, like the process of cultural Sovietization of Ukraine and how trying to answer the question of how Soviet Ukraine became possible um, like in the late 1930s onward, like the kind of the, the, the literary canon and the unification of power, cultural politics and, and, and uh, unification of other spheres, spheres too. Mainly I chose them because they are widely regarded as the greatest uh, poets of the time. And I think there is a consensus that in the 1920s there were five great artists in Ukraine. This was uh, Mykola Khvilovy in, in uh, kind of as a prose writer, Pavlo Tichina as a poet, Oleksandr Dovzhenko as a um, film director, uh, Mykola Kurbas as a theater director, and then uh, Mykola Kulish as a playwright. So uh, for me, I think, um, like kind of, on the one hand, I chose the China and Hwilovi as those kind of representatives, like, you know, as, as conventionally the greatest artists of the time. But at the same time, um, I chose them because I thought that they very nicely contribute each other, like not maybe also in, in kind of in, in, in artistic uh, manner, but at the same time in their um, in, in, in their life and, and their kind of political and, and public trajectory. And uh, for me, it was like kind of a, a paradox that the China, a poet of the National Revolution, a widely recognized poet of the National Revolution, who wrote one of the kind of unofficial anthems of, of the Ukrainian People's Republic, ended up to be a eulogist of the Soviet regime and, and became a party poet. And on the other hand, we have um, Mykola Khvilovy, who was a Communist Party member from 1919, so from the very early on, straight after um, being demobilized from the party, he, from the from the war, he joined the Communist Party, the Bolshevik Party, and he ended up um, to be one of the biggest critics of the centralized nature of the Communist Party, as it turned out to be. And 1933 was a kind of a uh, key year for both of my protagonists. In 1933, Mykola Khvilovy kind of perhaps we can say disenchanted in, in that Soviet regime, he committed suicide. While for Tichina, this was um, a milestone because he submitted his poem, um, Party of a Dead, the party leads um, to uh, the, the um, central Moscow-based newspaper Pravda, and it was published in Ukrainian, even without translation in Moscow. So, and, and with this kind of poem, um, he started his kind of path towards towards the, the uh, kind of the Soviet Olympus. And so it's kind of, for me, it was very interesting to see how those kind of different, different trajectories where they met and how kind of, what can we say about the culture and the period by looking at those kind of individual trajectories and, and how they kind of intersect and what does it tell us about basically um, those cultural products, the cultural period, the politics and so on. Actually in the 1920s, why it's so interesting uh, that Kharkiv for the first time becomes the center and it's not only the political center but also the cultural center, right? Kurbas and, and uh, uh, Kurbas 
was working in Kharkiv. Uh, all those uh, political, uh, or all those cultural um, activists and poets, they were all in Kharkiv because they believed that Kharkiv was the center. And it's also interesting um, to look at two of my protagonists, right? In a very, like, uh, until 1920 or 1921, uh, Ticina remained in, in Kyiv, but Khvilovy, after 1919, he was in, in Kharkiv. And Kvilovy was engaged in this process of creating what I call Soviet Ukrainian culture and or literature. And we can talk perhaps kind of about the distinction I'm trying to make in the book. Uh, but it is interesting how this kind of the relationship between the two capitals, the old and the new one, because at the time uh, the China was, was in Kyiv, but he's writing in his diaries that some of his friends um, Vasily Landlakitny, for instance, who was uh, formerly the leader of the Borodbisti party and then joined the Communist Party of Bolsheviks, he was a kind of cultural official in Kharkiv and he was inviting the China to come to Kharkiv because this is firstly the center, secondly, it can offer employment opportunities much needed during and shortly after the, the, um, the civil war, right? And third, it was like Kyiv was far away from any kind of distribution networks and so on. So kind of working in the cultural sphere in Kyiv was becoming very, very difficult. And at the same time, we have Hulevi, who has been living in Kharkiv for some time, by the time of, you know, 1920s. But at the same time, he writes in one of his letters that he would like to publish something in Kyiv-based periodicals because being recognized in Kyiv by those old line intel intelligentsia is very important for him as a proletarian writer. And so it's, it's an interesting dynamic, right? On the one hand, you have Kharkiv as a capital, a new capital of this new proletarian modern Soviet or Ukrainian and, and all different kind of also futurists, all, all those kind of um, modern uh, movements, they were all also kind of centered in Kharkiv. But at the same time, there is still this recognized um, authority of Kyiv and, and its kind of intelligentsia. So people like those cultural um, activists or, or authors or writers living in different capitals, they were trying to connect you know, despite ideological perhaps differences. And um, also like another perhaps this kind of example of an interaction between the two capitals is that, um, so writers, Hvilovy, although he was a very famous prose writer, he started writing with writing uh, poetry. And one of his poetic collections was dedicated to Ticina because they kind of, he uh, published a, like it, it was an almanac or a kind of a, a collection of poems. And the, he, together with his, you know, fellows, they believed that Ticina was the greatest poet living in Kharkiv, Ukrainian poet in Kharkiv. So they dedicated their um, collection to Ticina in Kharkiv. And then actually Ticina responded to that dedication saying, what do they want from me? So it's, it's kind of an interesting dynamic on the one hand, but I just wanted to perhaps um, contradict you by saying that Kharkiv was not important. Kharkiv, perhaps within, until 1936, before the capital had been kind of moved back to Kyiv, was, was a very important also cultural center. And uh, yeah, and, and it's also interesting to study how uh, you know, this this new traditionless kind of uh, city was was attracting people, you know, who were also trying to have young people who were coming all over Ukraine and perhaps the, the former Russian Empire to create something completely new from scratch. Um, and then uh, as to your uh, question about Sovietization. Um, so for me, Sovietization is, is, is both top down and bottom up process. Um, on the one hand, obviously, we have the Communist Party who is interested in, in, in say, subjugating, you know, the cultural sphere and its control and uh, who is trying to intervene um, in the cultural activities, in, in, in the artistic production and so on by different decrees, by material support, for instance, uh, by controlling the publication the distribution networks and so on and so on. And obviously, um, kind of the party is important in this process kind of of cultural Sovietization. But at the same time, we have a lot of writers who 
um, like for instance, uh, Hvilovy was uh, himself a member of the Communist Party and he was not just a member, you know, an opportunist member of the party. He was and kind of, he believed in, in, in socialism and he believed in Soviet Ukraine, perhaps not necessarily the Soviet Ukraine that came to be um, associated with the Communist Party of Bolsheviks, but he believed in a Soviet Ukraine um, a, a country like with a socialist government and perhaps a, a kind of a, an autonomous a communist party that that is not subjugated to Moscow but you know on a par with that in Moscow um, and they were he same Kulish was also a member of, I believe a member of the communist party but he definitely shared those socialist views and they all were creating um, socialist culture so this Sovietization for me is 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 also kind of a is a complex process of trying to meet the expectations of socially oriented writers and the kind of centralizing power of the state and the third component that i have explored in my uh, phd dissertation and and published as a separate um, article is the expectation of the readers because um, I think the readers, the audience was very important, uh, perhaps now as well, but in the 1920s, because um, on the one hand, we have the idea of the party about what Soviet culture should be like. Um, and on the other hand, we have writers who are creating kind of cultural products for the audience, right? But their expectations of the audience don't, don't always meet the expectations of the audience. And in this, my um, article, I have explored um, those reading appetites of uh, the working class audience in the 1920s and how, how they reacted on Ukrainian literature. And it is very interesting that while they were greatly fond of uh, traditional kind of 19th century literature, they were very much against, averse to the, uh, you know, those um, those uh, attempts of Hvilovy and, and, and his uh, followers, because they didn't really, they couldn't really understand this modernist literature. So I think um, there are these kind of three important components that all together at some point brought um, Soviet literature into being. Being a Ukrainian myself, you know, I kind of was well aware of, of, of uh, um, like kind of, you know, that the history of the 1920s and, and literature that was that was kind of uh, created at the time. And actually, my interest in this topic um, arose from my uh, bachelor dissertation because I started working on Ukrainian national communism, but it was more of a political history. I was working on um, different political uh, non-Bolshevik uh, communist parties in Ukraine in the 1920s. And um, basically like the Borodbisti, for instance, one of the most uh, famous uh, so, uh, co communist non-Bolshevik parties in the 1920s. And that kind of that, that my research, uh, also obviously I extended it during my dissertation, but it kind of provided me with the context for uh, the cultural processes in the 1920s. Um, so I have this, I, I had this interest is in Ukrainian national communism as a political history. And I, I have always been, uh, you know, a great uh, kind of reader. So I, I read a lot it's, uh, also of, of Ukrainian writers. And so I knew about these two writers. And this is why I kind of, for me, the choice was obvious when I started working first on my dissertation and then revising it into a book. So there was no question whom I wanted to write about. So the Chin and Hvilovy were kind of already there. Um, I just needed to think about like kind of the conceptual fra framework, how I will put these two biographies together. Uh, but as for the primary research, of course, uh, so I think um, for my research, I used uh, different corpuses of sources. Firstly, there is obviously this, uh, the literary, literary um, kind of the output of those two writers, uh, because um, it's, it's kind of I'm trying to to use their uh, creative writing and poems as a source for like as a historical source. Um, secondly, obviously, uh, there are a lot of letters, memoirs, like ego documents uh, left uh, 
uh, by those uh, writers. So I also use those. But at the same time, it is impossible to investigate the cultural politics um, in Soviet Ukraine without looking at party documents and, and so on. So this is like a third corpus of sources that I've used. Um, but also because the, the 1920s, this, this decade has been widely studied. There are a lot of uh, a lot of documents have already been published, for instance, or uh, there are a lot of biographies of the Chin and Hulevi, especially because they are such prominent figures in, in, in the Ukrainian studies. So it's kind of um, my book and the dissertation and the book is a combination of, of uh, um, yeah, primary and secondary sources and uh, yeah, I think actually I was more surprised by the lack of sources rather than, you know, something interesting that I have found in the sources because I thought that or kind of I naively thought that there would be a lot of sources that could help me, uh, you know, kind of work with, with, with those biographies of those two literary men. Um, but actually uh, it's, 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 it, it was actually a surprise that such a great writer as Mykola Khvilovy had almost no sources, uh, you know, kind of available on him in, in Ukrainian archives. And then I understood, of course, that it was uh, due to this targeted um, poli policies of the, of, the, of the Soviet authorities, because uh, Khvilovy, after his suicide, he was recognized as an oppositionary, as, as, you know, kind of a nationalist and so on and so on. So not only his works um, have been deleted from libraries and, and, and bookstores, but also all his documents um, were, uh, were uh, destroyed and so on. So it's actually very hard to find something on Khvilovy. Um, whereas there are abundance of sources on Tichina, and it's not surprising, of course, because um, a part of, uh, apart from being an, uh, a writer, a party eulogist uh, from the 1930s onwards, he also occupied a lot of important political posts, including the uh, he was a, a I believe a minister minister of education. He was a, a member of the Ukrainian parliament, and so on and so on. So there are abundant like the sources on on uh, Tichina are multiple, like and in all different archives, but it's actually so little of use among those thousands of files that, that a historian can actually look and think that, oh yes, this is useful. And at some, um, at some point I, I came across um, an observation that, uh, or, or also a piece of memoir um, that his wife, Tichina's wife, Lydia Paparuk, was actually responsible for kind of fashioning a Soviet Tichina, that she was meticulously going through all his, um, I don't know, like like papers to, to delete everything that, you know, could perhaps present him in a, in a not very favorable light. And of course, whatever is left after the China is also the result of, you know, some kind of compilation and so on. And the China, due to his, we can say, nationalistic background, his, him being a member of the, um, a member or a kind of supporter of the Ukrainian uh, revolution in, 19, in 1917, he was very cautious afterwards about what he was writing. So self-censorship for, for him was very important. Um, so what I want to say is that uh, you, either have no sources and a lot of sources, but it doesn't matter because they are not sufficient to, to, to kind of make some discoveries. Um, but at the same time, what, what was interesting for me is that um, it was actually possible while, while reading their, um, uh, you know, their art uh, creative works and their diaries or, and their uh, correspondence with other people, it was possible to put all these three together, that sometimes what you read in a diary somehow comes together with, you know, a letter written to, to like to their fellows or something, and it explains or kind of elaborates on that one line in a diary, and you can put it together as a puzzle. And it's, 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 it's actually interesting. This is, I think, was perhaps the most interesting part of this, my kind of research work when you find these different pieces of a puzzle and then put them together and you can decipher something behind like just one line in a diary. Perhaps I kind of 
I will start with an anecdote related to to the China. Uh, when I was working um, in the uh, you know in the in the Vernadsky National uh, Library in Kiev. I was um, I ordered a lot of books on Tichina and then um, I wanted to return those books and somebody a man in his 60s or 70s saw me returning those books and he, he asked me do you really read Tichina don't you know he's like you know kind of those uh, silly poems that everyone was supposed to read um, like he's not a real poet and that was actually very interesting for me because when I went to school I read Tachina as one of the greatest poets, you know, of the 1920s. So what we learned of Tachina was very different to that, that that man actually learned of Tachina. And this is kind of relates very well to your question, because um, during the, the, this kind of 70 years of the Soviet rule, there was obviously one literary canon, right? And then with the independence in, in, in 1991, um, Ukraine in Ukraine, a new literary canon started to be developed by returning the names of those uh, from the 1920s. And of course, the Khvilovi and the China were one of the, one of those kind of members of that new canon. But while um, the China uh, by, well, for the China, only his poetry of the early 1920s and some selected poems from, from the later period were accepted in the, uh, this literary canon. Khvilovi was kind of incorporated in, in full, or almost in full, because there are also some very highly, um, highly uh, kind of propaganda-like pieces in, like, written by Khvilovi in, in, the late, in the early 1930s as well. But um, it is interesting that that Khvilovi, for instance, he has not been or he had not been um, uh, rehabilitated in, in the 1950s like many other uh, those convicted and repressed writers. So he was sort of returned to to you know kind of to the to, to the Ukrainian um, cultural life only in the late 1980s in the kind of in in the 19 in the 1990s. So what I want to say is there are obviously kind of on, on the one hand, we try to forget everything that was Soviet and create something, you know, that is Ukrainian and kind of the foundation of the of the of the new literary canon is very kind of anti-Soviet. But what is important uh, to remember, and this I think what I'm trying to do with my book is that to understand that neither of those poets or cultural figures, they were only Ukrainians or only Soviets. Um, so you need to understand that, that there was not either or, like the choice, like either or was not really an option for them. And those people, Khvilovi and Tichina alike, they went through a non-linear evolution of their creative writing, of their political views, of their public agenda. And obviously this evolution, it was defined also kind of by the authorities, but at the same time, it was their also personal evolution. And I think that this, this, their attempt to create the Soviet Ukrainian literature, something that would be both Soviet and Ukrainian, it's kind of worth to remember as an episode of the 1920s and not just to discard it, just because there was something of kind of socially oriented or those people were sympathizers of, of socialism or, or, or communists. It's just obviously, I think the main problem is that we often uh, judge in retrospect because we know the result. That's why we kind of judge the intentions or aspirations of those people from the very early on. And this is, I think, is, is a great mistake because I think in the early 1920s, um, what what Hvilovi and Kulish, uh, supported by Alexander Shumsky or later Mikola Skripnik, what they meant by Soviet Ukrainian culture was was very different to what we understand as a Soviet culture of the later period. And by re-evaluating this period and their aspiration and cultural searches, I think we will make our understanding of the 1920s and the whole Ukrainian culture much more broad and, and, and rich and interesting. Of course, uh, I'm kind of trying to, I'm, I'm focusing in my book on, on the Chin and Hvilovi, right? But, but there are other scholars who have been working on, on other, uh, you know, key uh, cultural figures. So we have a recent study by Mehil Fowler, who was working on uh, Kurbas and Kulish.
Um, there is also a very uh, important work uh, by uh, Vira Heva in Ukraine, who had recently published a volume on uh, on Bajan. And there is also another uh, publication of uh, translations of from of Bajan. So I think this there are a lot of kind of there are now uh, those attempts of uh, reevaluating those uh, cultural figures whom we thought we know a lot about already, but a new fresh look at their biographies or even their creative writing in the context of, you know, kind of in the, in the more problematized context of the debate uh, of the decade and the period allows for a more nuanced understanding of, uh, of their, uh, you know, of their life and their work. And I think the more uh, work like this is being done, the better, again, for, you know, kind of showing um, how important this decade was for the entire Soviet uh, culture and for the independent Ukraine as well. But at the same time, it will show us that um, the 1920s in Soviet Ukraine uh, were not, it was not just another kind of uh, the, the continuation of the Moscow line or the Moscow story. Because when you look at, at those, um, at each uh, particular writer, you understand that they were working um, kind of with Kharkiv or with Ukraine in mind. They did not orient themselves against or towards Moscow. So that it, it's very important to, it's, it's kind of, it becomes clear that the Soviet Union in the 1920s was not, was not as centralized and unified as we tend to think based on the late kind of socialism and the 1940s and 1950s onwards. So uh, I think it's one of the also key messages of my book that um, in the kind of these formative decades, the artistic map of the Soviet Union was quite decentralized and writers who were working in, in Kharkiv saw themselves on a par with those working in Moscow. And um, I open open up my book with uh, this discussion of um, the visit of Ukrainian uh, delegation to Moscow in 1929. And then there is a, sec a separate section on this visit in my book when a lot of writers, um, they write that this was in 1929, that this was the first time they went to Moscow or they went to Russia. So it, it, it is interesting to see how these people, even it's already kind of 12 years after the revolution, how they still see Russia as, as a near abroad, that there is a border. Although if you think about Kharkiv, right, that the kind of geographical position, Russia was much closer than Kyiv, but they still speak about the border in between the two republics, ideological, cultural, political border. And when they go there, a lot of, even like from the, from the Russian side, there are a lot of talks that finally two literatures, equal literatures and cultures meet. So, um, I think this is what also is important to understand that 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 the Soviet culture was a process in itself and the 1920s 1930s were a formative period in kind of the process of establishing this cultural canon the kind of very centralized cultural canon of the later decades and by looking um at the 1920s on the like looking at the 1920s and those cultural cultural figures who have been creating those those sort of separatist cultural projects, either in Ukraine or with Belarus and, and, and Georgia and other Soviet republics, we will also know, we will also kind of have a better and more nuanced understanding of how the Soviet Union worked in the early decades as well. So I think it's, it's, it's an important um, question for, you know, re-evaluation of the entire Soviet history, not just, you know, Ukrainian history, but, but the Soviet history. Um, as a whole. No, actually, this was very interesting, and I'm and I'm really appreciate the opportunity, you know, to talk about my book. So thank you once again for inviting me. Bye bye,